1947 saw the beginning of the final struggle for Palestine. Arabs were trying to hold on to their home, whereas Zionists were bent on displacing them to create a home for themselves. The power equation was very lopsided in favor of the Zionists overall, but the economic and financial muscle of both sides showed the greatest disparity. In order to try to catch up a bit, in 1944, the Arabs had created an Arab National Fund to buy land that might otherwise have been bought by the Zionist Jewish National Fund. In 1946, Yusuf Sayer, a Palestinian Christian, was appointed the first Director General of the Fund. By mid-1947, the Arab National Fund had raised about $700,000 US dollars worth. This was deemed a huge achievement, and rightly so, because the Palestinians were by and large a very impoverished nation then. Yusuf Sayer told his colleagues in the fund's board to keep this figure secret, but a euphoric member of the board bragged in public about it. The very next day, Sayer and his colleagues were shocked to learn that a rich South African Jewish widow had donated a sum equivalent to about 4 million US dollars to the Jewish National Fund. I am Dr. Hassan Bukhari and this is the ninth episode of our series Palestine versus Israel. Cicero had long ago said the sinews of war are infinite money. The Zionists certainly appreciated this ancient wisdom as they geared up for one of the largest land grabs in post-World War II history. But they hadn't put all their hopes on financial muscle alone. They also could rely on their foreign allies, especially the USA led by the Zionist sympathizer Harry Truman, to influence the UN in their favor. The Zionists had a proper proto-state in the form of the Jewish agency and well-trained and relatively better armed proto-armies like the Haganah and Ergun. In contrast, the Arabs of Palestine didn't have any powerful foreign allies, a functioning executive or a properly trained and armed militia. They were no match for the Zionists in the political, military, diplomatic and economic spheres. Nominally, Mufti Amin al-Husseini, in exile in Egypt, was dominating the Arab higher committee through his relative Jamal al-Husseini. But other factions like the Nashashabis continued to oppose him and serve other masters like King Abdullah of Jordan. King Abdullah himself was busy negotiating a deal with Zionists to partition Palestine and get the Arab portion of Palestine for his own kingdom. Even at this perilous hour, the Arab elite was busy fighting for scraps as the Zionists were sharpening their knives to slice the cake. At the end of the last episode, we had discussed that Britain had referred the question of Palestine's future to the UN General Assembly in early 1947 in the hope that it would end up recommending a UN trusteeship of Palestine under British management. The UN General Assembly created the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, also known as the UNSCOP, in May 1947. UNSCOP had representatives from 11 countries, India, Sweden, Peru, Iran, Yugoslavia, Australia, Canada, Czechoslovakia, Guatemala, Mexico, and the Netherlands. To British disappointment, the UNSCOP was unified in recommending an end to the British mandate in Palestine. However, the members of UNSCOP differed significantly in their recommendations for the future of Palestine. Seven countries, that is Canada, Czechoslovakia, Guatemala, the Netherlands, Peru, Sweden, and Uruguay issued a report also dubbed the Majority Report recommending the partition of Palestine. Three countries, India, Iran, and Yugoslavia issued a different report, also dubbed the Minority Report, recommending a federation. 
Australia abstained. The majority report recommended partition, but there was a problem in proposing this solution. The Jews were in a minority in all regions of Palestine and held only 6% of Palestine's land. So which areas were to be given to the Jews in a partition? The majority report came up with an ingenious solution. The areas where the percentage of Jewish land holdings was highest were allotted to the future Zionist state of Israel. The majority report also inexplicably allotted the huge Negev desert constituting about half of Palestine's total area to Israel, despite there being no significant Zionist population or land holdings there. Basically, the Zionists desperately wanted to have a port on the Red Sea and the majority report obliged by handing them the Negev. One might ask why the majority report was so pro-Zionist. The answer lies in the global friendships of Zionists. The seven countries that proposed it were either a part of the West, like Sweden, the Netherlands and Canada, or from US-dominated Latin America, like Peru, Guatemala and Uruguay. Czechoslovakia's support for the majority report can be explained through the Soviet Union's stance, which was pro-Zionist in those days. Czechoslovakia was behind the Iron Curtain then and was effectively a satellite of the Soviet Union. The minority report was produced by Iran, India and Yugoslavia, all three of whom were trying to chart a somewhat neutral course in a bipolar world back then. The minority report envisioned a single federal state after three years under UN trusteeship. There were to be two separate Jewish and Arab entities, like in present-day Bosnia and Herzegovina, but a central government with both Jewish and Arab ministers sharing power. The minority report also allocated the Negev to the Arab entity. Both the minority and majority reports of the UNSCOP were issued on the 3rd of September 1947. The next course of action was a debate in the UN General Assembly on both reports. Britain, disappointed in its hope to keep control of Palestine under UN auspices, declared on September 26 that the British would withdraw from Palestine and end their rule in Palestine unilaterally by mid-May 1948. On October 11, Herschel Johnson, the US representative on the UN General Assembly's Palestine Committee, announced President Truman's decision to endorse partition subject to certain amendments and modifications. Truman wanted to sweeten the pill for Arabs by recommending the allocation of Negev to the Arab state. But Chaim Weizmann promptly visited the president and made him change his mind. In order to get the majority report passed by the UN General Assembly, a two-thirds majority was required. This uphill task was eased by the fact that both superpowers were supporting the majority report. The causes of USA's support for Zionism have been discussed before, but the USSR's support for Zionism at that critical juncture puzzles many casual readers of history. Basically, the USSR wanted a Zionist state in the Middle East as a counter to the Arab states who were still much dependent on the British regarding their economy and military. The most important political force among the Zionists was the Labour Zionists of the Mapai party led by Ben Gurion who were considered sympathetic to socialism. The USSR was harboring hopes of finding a socialist ally in the Middle East in the form of Israel, led by Ben-Gurion. Still, obtaining a two-thirds majority for an obviously unjust scheme like the majority report was not effortless. Excellent Zionist lobbying played a huge role. As early as 1943, the Zionists had created a robust institution named the American Zionist Emergency Council for Effective Lobbying. According to Howard Sacker, the AZEC, in fact, was one of the most formidable pressure groups of its time. With a large budget and 14 professionally staffed departments, it was capable of obtaining mass signatures for petitions 
or a flood of letters to Washington in a matter of days. The Zionists also recruited many congressmen, senators and Supreme Court justices to influence foreign heads of states and either cajoled or threatened them into voting for the majority plan. The UN vote was scheduled to be held on 27 November 1947, but the required two-thirds majority hadn't been achieved by then. So the Zionist backers forced a postponement through filibustering and USA ratcheted up the pressure on some fence-sitting delegates. For example, Liberia was threatened by the famous rubber and tire industry mogul Harvey Firestone Jr who himself was blackmailed and threatened by a Zionist boycott, who warned Libya that he would suspend plans for the expansion of his plant operations in Liberia if it voted against partition. Finally, on November 29, 1947, the General Assembly passed Resolution 181 recommending the partition of Palestine by a margin of 33 to 13 with 10 abstentions. The Latin American countries, prompted by the USA, played a pivotal role in the passage of this resolution. Palestinian historian Rashid Khalidi has succinctly analyzed the monumental event in his book The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. The November 29, 1947 passage in the UN General Assembly of Resolution 181 which called for dividing Palestine into a large Jewish state and a small Arab one with an international corpus separatum encompassing Jerusalem, reflected the new global balance of power. The United States and USSR, which both voted in favor of the resolution, now clearly played the decisive role in sacrificing the Palestinians for a Jewish state to take their place and control over most of their country. The resolution was another declaration of war, providing the international birth certificate for a Jewish state in most of what was still an Arab majority land, a blatant violation of the principle of self-determination enshrined in the UN Charter. The expulsion of enough Arabs to make possible a Jewish majority state necessarily and inevitably followed. Just to elucidate the point more clearly, I will mention some simple statistics. At the time of the passage of the partition resolution, there were only about 600,000 Jews in Palestine. The Arabs numbered about 1.3 million, that is more than twice that of Jews. Jews owned only 6% of the land area of Palestine. However, the Arabs got only 45% of Palestine under the UN partition plan. The Arab state got more than 800,000 Arabs and just 10,000 Jews, whereas the Jewish state got 55% of the land and more than 400,000 Arabs. Such a huge Arab minority was a serious hindrance to the development of an exclusively Jewish state. The Zionist leaders had time and again stressed that Israel was to be a state for the Jews only. Now the UN partition plan placed these hundreds of thousands of Arab people in grave peril. Geographically, the Arab state was composed of three disconnected patches of land. This fact alone ensured that an Arab state in the form sectioned by the partition plan would be an unsustainable one. To put the icing on the cake, the UN plan didn't include the provision of a UN armed force in Palestine to keep the peace during chaotic transfer of power after the British departure. The USA didn't support the creation of a peacekeeping force because it dreaded the presence of the forces of the USSR or any of its communist allies in Palestine. The Zionists wisely and the Arabs foolishly were looking forward to a trial of strength and didn't press for a peacekeeping forces formation. Both the Zionists and the Arabs had no intention of accepting or respecting the partition plan. Both wanted all or most of Palestine at least. But in sharp contrast to the Arabs, the Zionists were ready for a war. Almost immediately after the UN vote, the Arab Higher Committee called for a three-day general strike from 2nd to 4th December. 
Violence between the Jews and the Arabs began soon after. In the beginning, the fighting mainly consisted of tit-for-tat terrorist attacks and murderous riots, but by the spring, a full-scale war was raging throughout Palestine. Let's take a look at the opposing forces during this phase of the conflict. The Arabs had boasted a lot about throwing the Zionists into the sea in case of open conflict, but their preparations were pitiful. To make matters worse, their perpetual disunity transformed the uphill task of defeating the Zionists or even holding on to the territory given to them by the UN into an impossible one. Three distinct Arab forces operated within Palestine during early 1948. Mufti Amin al-Husseini tried to unify the Palestinian resistance under his command but was thwarted by other Arab rivals. The forces loyal to him were commanded by his relative Abdul Qadir al husseini a gallant commander during the 1936 Arab Revolt. Then there were the Arab Volunteers, funded and supplied by the Arab League. They were named the Arab Liberation Army and were led by Fauzi al kautji another veteran of the 1936 Arab Revolt. The third force was King Abdullah of Jordan's Nashashabi clients, who wanted the Arab part of Palestine to become a part of Abdullah's kingdom. All three Arab forces were hostile towards each other in varying degrees. The Nashashibi and Husseini forces continued to fight each other as they had during the Arab revolt. Relations between the al Husseini forces and the Arab Liberation Army were far from cordial as well. Abdul Qadir al Husseini wanted to synergize with the Arab Liberation Army and even went to Damascus to meet with General Taha al Hashmi, the Inspector General and the Administrative Head of the Arab Liberation Army, and asked for weapons. Taha rudely refused. In addition to these forces, there were also some 2,000 Egyptian volunteers belonging to the Muslim Brotherhood organization. By the spring of 1948, the Arab forces had been divided into three zones and were operating largely independently of each other and without any synergy. In the northern sector, Fauzi al kaukji led the Arab Liberation Army's 7,000 fighters. Abdul Qadir al Husseini and his 5,000 men operated in the central sector, whereas in the southern Negev Desert, the Muslim Brotherhood volunteers were active. The Nashashibi forces, in accordance with King Abdullah's secret dealings with the Zionists, did not take any part in action against the Zionists. The Zionist forces presented a very contrasting picture. As a result of their World War II experience, the Zionist forces had much superior leadership, training and organization. The main Zionist force was the Haganah, but the Ergun and the Stern Gang had significant strength and both of them were coordinating their actions with the Haganah. Haganah's professional proficiency can be gauged from the fact that it had established a supreme general staff under Yaakov Dori as early as 1939. According to Trevor Dupai, by 1947, this underground GHQ of an underground army had been functioning and preparing itself for probable conflict with the Arabs for more than eight years. During those eight years, there had been many opportunities to expand the base of professional military experience throughout the Haganah. Dubai further writes about the Haganah. The Haganah by 1947 had become an efficient organization of trained, ready combat troops. It had a mission, it had a doctrine, and its actions were controlled by an experienced group of military professionals in a general staff that had been planning and operating for eight years. Despite its weaknesses, particularly its shortage of weapons, it was, with the possible exception of the withdrawing British Deviants, the most formidable military force in the Middle East when the United Nations 1947 partition plan heralded the outbreak of full-scale war between Jews and Arabs. Haganah's strength in the spring of 1948 was about 21,000. It was supplemented by 3,000 well-trained Palmach men, 5,000 Irgun troops, and 1,000 members of the Stern Gang. From December 1947 to March 1948, riots and terrorism resulted in the deaths of 1,200 Jews and at least as many Arabs. 
By the end of March 1948, both sides had arrayed their forces for a more conventional sort of war. At the outbreak of proper armed conflict in Palestine, the Zionists were better trained, better armed, better led, and better organized. More ominously for the Arabs, Zionist forces also heavily outnumbered them in the field with about 30,000 Zionist troops facing 14,000 Arabs. Moreover, the Arab war effort was completely disjointed and fragmented, whereas the Zionists had the advantages of unity and synergy as well. The result was a foregone conclusion, perhaps. Interestingly, as Palestine descended into anarchy and war, the UN remained sound asleep. After lighting the powder keg with its extremely unjust partition plan, the UN didn't bother to lift a single finger to stop the bloodshed in Palestine. Jorge Garcia Granados, the Guatemalan delegate at the UN, observed, A strange lethargy overtook the United Nations. War continued in Palestine, but nothing seemed to move at the United Nations. In the next episode of Palestine vs. Israel, we will discuss the beginning of the Arab genocide by Zionists under Plan Dalet and explain the events that led to the outbreak of the first Arab-Israeli war in 1948. Stay tuned, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.